Merry Christmas. I, uh, I love this time of year. I love the way it connects people to each other. Just the special celebration of incredible fact that God sent his son to earth. So I, I'm saying Merry Christmas to you in the very richest meaning of the word. And I really wish that I could be with you in your campus or in your home and, and that we could share this moment together. But I want to try to ask you a couple of questions about Christmas. And I hope to bring a fresh perspective, maybe, maybe teach you a few things, but really just bring a freshness to our celebration of the amazing fact that God sent his son to save us. What does it mean to find a savior? So I want to ask you this question from a new perspective. If Jesus were to come, and if you had been in his day, so you lived in the first century, do you think you would have been the kind of person that said, I think this is the Messiah, the, the coming one, the, the one we were expecting, or do you think you would have, like with the most of the people, miss it? So update that. If Jesus were to come right now, would you be the kind of person that would accept him, that would understand him? So this unique perspective was taken by a guy named Jonas. He is a, a Norwegian who was raised in a godless home, but he, was, he became kind of interested in people who claim to be Jesus or claim to be a voice from God or claim to be starting a new religion. And he just started doing some, he's a photographer and a journalist, so he started doing some investigations saying, if there was a voice from God, the son of God, a prophet, what would it be like? And so he adapted himself to that situation by saying, well, first of all, they'd have to be a public figure. Um, they wouldn't be somebody that was just hiding in a cave back somewhere. Then they would need to be giving new information. So writing scripture, speaking scripture, something like that. And then he wanted somebody who'd been around a while. Um, it couldn't be somebody who just decided they were Jesus yesterday. Somebody who you got to see how their movement went. And so he went literally around the world uh, interviewing and photographing people who claim to be the sent one from God. And so one of his earliest ones was a guy named Vasarian who lives in Siberia. And uh, <clears throat> he used to be a uh, traffic policeman. And he has now actually got quite uh, a going concern. He's been uh, the Jesus in Siberia for several decades. And he actually has a collection of five to 10,000 people. They live in little villages around there and they have their own celebrations. They have very ornate processions, as you see here, and beautiful choral pieces. So it has a lot of the trappings of religion. And he claims to be Jesus who comes from God. And so he went to visit him in Siberia and took pictures. And then there were some more obscure ones. This guy's from England. David is, uh, they, he called him a MI5 whistleblower. I do not know what the story behind that was, but he's, he's big on the internet or little on the internet, but he's got a few followers. And then he went down to South Africa where there's a guy named Moses Longwin, Long, Longwine. And, uh, and he is more like a, a revival from a charismatic revival in the South. And there's lots of energy and lots of singing and lots of celebration. And, and uh, he, he wears his hat that says Lord of Lords on it, just so you could be clear about who he was. And one of the interesting things about this is he's come up to a wedding that, that made a big deal, not only because he was getting married, but he declared that his wedding was the beginning of the end of days. I am not sure that's a great way to start your wedding, saying it's the beginning of the end of days, but that was kind of part of his pro projecting the future. And then he went down into uh, Zambia, and in the marketplace there, there was a guy who's taken the name Jesus, and he's evangelizing and telling people that he is the Christ. And in his, that's his, his evening and weekend job. Uh, his day job is he's still keeping employed as a taxi driver. And something that was kind of humorous to me is on, on the door of it, it says Lord of Lords, so that you can tell who he really is even when he's driving his taxi. Then you go to Brazil, and there is a guy who's changed his name to Henry Cristo. And Henry stands for the, the initials of the Latin that was put over the cross of Christ which meant 
Jesus, King of the Jews. And so he, he has his own compound there. He preaches to his followers. He has a convenient rolling throne that they can push around his compound and, and they have services and they have a variety of people. You could go to Australia where there's a, a guy named Jesus who married Mary and he claims to remember when he was crucified, that he's literally the, the reincarnation of Jesus. There's a guy in Japan. And, and some of these seem funny and maybe I made light of them. But what a tragedy that Thousands of people around the world are following somebody who says, I'm the voice of God. I am a prophet. I am the son of God. I am speaking for God. And they are following a delusion and they are devoted, sometimes sacrificially so. But they have found a Messiah. They found a savior who's not a savior. So I want us to to back up and ask the question, what are the marks of a savior? If you're going to, to be somebody who finds the genuine savior, what would that look like? What would he be like? And I hope that that fresh perspective brings you back to that question of who is Jesus and how do we really value and understand and appreciate who he is and what he's done and what he is now doing. So what would the marks of a savior be? And I've used the word Messiah. I've used the word Christ. And some people don't even realize that Messiah simply means anointed one. And we talked a couple of weeks ago about that King David was anointed when he was chosen to be king. And so it's, it's a sign of God's choosing. It's a sign of the Holy Spirit. The oil that came down on their head was a picture of the Holy Spirit taking uh, precedence in their lives, coming into them. And so the Messiah is the term that the Hebrews used when they talked about the one who was to come, the promised one who would bring, uh, he would bring a way to make everything right. And then in the Greek, that same exact word is Christ. So when you say Jesus Christ, you're saying Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. That's literally what you're saying. He's also called the anointed one or the, the one who was to come or uh, obviously we, we also see him as the savior, the one who is to save us. So if you think about all of that, how would we recognize Jesus? How did they recognize Jesus? What are the credentials he brings? When you look at all these people claiming to be the Messiah, how do we know that Jesus is the real Messiah? In fact, this was one of the things that I doubted when I was going through a struggle of faith as a high schooler is how can we say that Jesus is the only one when there's so many, when there is Muhammad and Buddha and, and all of these people who claim to be speaking for God? How do, how do we have the arrogance to think that we're the right ones? And I think it's really helpful to examine who Jesus is and who he was and what he said, and to answer honestly the questions, what would be the marks of a savior? So let's go back to the book of Hebrews chapter one, and it's, in your uh, app there, if you've got it open, or you can turn your Bible there. And in Hebrews, he says, in the past, God spoke to us, to our ancestors, through the prophets at many times and in various ways. So he spoke through Moses, he spoke through Daniel and Jeremiah and Isaiah, and he, he references all of this history. And then he says, but in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. And through whom he made the universe, by the way, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. So let me just kind of boil this down. He says, if we're going to expect a voice from God, it should be consistent with already what God has said. It shouldn't be different if God is the same. And it should be consistent with the character of God himself. So let's examine Jesus' claims, especially in light of others who have claimed over the years, like Baha'u'llah, who began the Baha'i faith, like Joseph Smith, the father of Mormonism, like David Koresh of the Branch Davidian. How do we know that Jesus is telling us the truth? Let me, let me show you some of the characteristics. If we're going to have a genuine savior, then he needs to have the character of God. He needs to have a God-sized vision to save the world and to, to give his life for others. Instead, many messiahs, many false Christs, 
they really seem to be about themselves. I mean, as you go through the story, it's like they've developed their compound, they've developed their group of villages where people worship them, where they get to have people serve them, where they have, in some, some cases, they have their own private jet or their own private helicopter. It's hard to see that they are giving themselves for the world. It actually looks like they're trying to get their devotees to give themselves so that they can have a comfortable life. That a real Messiah shouldn't be about getting wealth and power. (laughs) And many of them seem to be getting women that they can marry multiple women or that they can have them serve them. What what was Jesus like? Even though he was absolutely fully God, Philippians 2 says that he emptied himself, that that he became a human being, that he didn't just live as the king of all human beings, that he came in the poorest of homes. When Joseph and Mary came to offer an offering at the birth of their son at the temple, there there were a couple of options. They could have given a lamb, but that was for the more wealthy people, or they could have given a couple of doves. And the doves was the offering of poor people. And so Jesus lived in a poor home, in in a conquered country, in a tiny little town called Nazareth. And he poured out his life for us. He qualifies to be a savior. And then the second part, which I just mentioned, is it should be consistent with what God has already said. So first of all, if we believe that there is a God, he would have communicated to us. Hebrews says in the past, he's spoken through many different ways. And the Old Testament is full of the ways that God has spoken. And, and so if he's going to send the Messiah it should be a continuation consistent with not only the character of God, but the prophecies that God has given to us. So let's look at some of those prophecies specifically, because this is a fascinating part that proves Jesus is the only possible savior. So he was prophetically declared to come from the line of David. Now, When there were 12 tribes of Judah, we know that in Genesis, Judah, the tribe of Judah is selected to be the one that the the king would come from. And then David in 2 Samuel, he's promised that he will always have a son on the throne. And eventually that came true because the first chapter of Matthew and the third chapter of Luke goes through a detailed analysis of Jesus' genealogy. So, All of them come through David. We think there's a slight difference because one of them is Mary's line and one of them is Joseph's line. So both his legal father, Joseph, and his physical mother, they were both from the line of David. So frankly, that cuts down a lot of people's claims to be the Messiah. If you've got to be a Jewish person who's from the specific line of David, that's a pretty small group. And then one of the most specific prophecies, which I think is amazing, is there is a forecast prediction from 700 years before Christ that he will be born in a specific place. Let's look at Micah chapter five, verse two. But you Bethlehem Ephrathah. Now, often people just skip over that because it's hard to say and they don't know what it means, but that's a very important word. Let me explain. He says, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be the ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. So when the Magi came, and in fact, it it kind of unfolds like a modern day Dan, Dan Brown novel. They were putting together clues from Daniel and from the star. And then they came to Jerusalem and they said, where is the one who's born king of the Jews? And Herod went to his scribes, the the people who were supposed to know the Bible, and they came up with this verse. So they knew that this was a prediction of the Messiah. And they said, he's going to be born in Bethlehem of Judea or Bethlehem Ephrathah. So what you may not realize is that there are two towns in Bethlehem at the time. One of the towns is right next door to Nazareth where Jesus lived. And one of the towns is way down here, seven miles below Jerusalem. And so God had to move the entire Roman army or the Roman world, if you will, so that there was a census so that everybody went to their hometown to be taxed and to have a census taken. And so instead of simply 
going to Nazareth, going to Bethlehem, which was a few miles away. They had to go a hundred miles away, uh, about a 31 hour walk, according to my calculations, to go to the right place to be born. The Bethlehem Ephrathah, the Bethlehem of Ephraim, the Bethlehem that was in Judah. He said, that's where the Messiah will be born. So no matter what you think about Jesus trying to fulfill his role as the Messiah, it's pretty difficult to choose where you're going to be born. So it's just saying this cuts the number of people who could be the Messiah way, way down. If you have to be from the line of David and you have to have been born in Bethlehem. Now it gets even harder than that. The next one is it has to come in the appropriate time frame. Now this is a little complex. So hang with me. Daniel chapter nine, he talks about a prophecy and he, he names it a specific date <clears throat> that from the time the decree to return from exile to the rebuilding of Jerusalem, which we know from history was 445 BC to the time when the Messiah will be cut off is going to be about, and he, and he uses a metaphor, 69 weeks of years, which is about 480 some years. So they wouldn't have known exactly the time frame, but they would have known that generally he had to be born in the first 35 years of what we call AD, that they would have known that. And in fact, I think that's why the Magi were able to interpret the star. This is part of the Dan Brown novel unfolding with symbols and prophecies and the star and, and they're following it through. So if we say that somebody had to be of the line of David and they had to be born in Bethlehem and it had to be within this 35 years, that becomes one person possible. Let's look at a few more. The prediction of his crucifixion, Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 describe somebody who is hung on a cross and their bones are out of joint and the dryness of mouth and, and the, the people he says, they're gambling for my garments at the foot of the cross. And somehow David received a vision to be able to understand the crucifixion and tell us that was going to be a picture of how the Messiah was going to be cut off. And so crucifixion was clearly predicted through the Old Testament. And then the resurrection in Isaiah 53, there's just a glimpse a few times that there's going to be a resurrection following the death. So when you think about all of those factors, you realize <laughs> we are way beyond impossible. In fact, it's according to the calculations, one out of times, one out of 10 to the 157th billions of the chance for anybody to fulfill all these prophecies. And obviously there's only one who did. What other marks of a savior would we have? Well, if he's going to be from God, in Jesus case, he was... God in the flesh, wouldn't you expect miracles, special things? They wouldn't be just rolling around in a, in a throne on a wheel or, or creating a little culture in Siberia. They would be doing God-sized things. And so you look at the life of Jesus, and obviously one of the huge things is the virgin birth. And the virgin birth was forecast from Isaiah chapter 7, but specifically we know because an angel came to Mary and said, I have great news for you. You are going to have a child and his name is going to be called Jesus and he will save his people from their sins. And, and, and he goes on and on. And I'm sure all Mary heard was, you're going to have a baby. And then she asks the obvious question since she was a virgin. And she said, how will this be? since I am a virgin. And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. I don't know if you've thought this through, but God had to do a specific miracle so that Jesus could be 100% God and 100% man. And he implanted this special life in the womb of Mary. And she was entrusted with this incredible responsibility. And she says, how can this be? And he says, you're not going to fully understand this, but the, the, the picture of the Holy Spirit overshadowing, caretaking, implanting this, this embryo and giving her life in her womb that was going to be the son of God because he had to be born sinless. He couldn't have the sinful nature that all of us have been given. 
in, at birth that all of us have. And so he had to come in a special way. And that virgin birth, and I know there are some people that say that virgin birth, that's hard to believe. But honestly, I don't know why it's harder to believe than any other miracle. And, and usually I say, if Joseph could believe it, when his wife comes back from the hill country pregnant, and he believed it, then I think I could be able to believe it. Other things in Jesus' life, obviously, also talked about the miraculous nature of his life. The angels announced the birth of John the Baptist to Zechariah, announcement to Mary, the announcement of the angels to the shepherds, the, the work that Jesus did eventually as he grew up, he, he healed many, multiplying loaves and fishes to feed thousands. And, and in fact, all of those things, walking on water, all of those kinds of stories, those are what you would expect if you have the supernatural. So Jesus clearly fulfills all of those. Most of the people that I'm talking about that have a claim of being a Messiah, they have no verifiable miracles. They, they're just human beings who are making great claims. And then we go on down. Obviously, if someone came in the name of the Lord, they would be holy and wise, absolutely separate from sin. And I was thinking about this. It's like, we know that Jesus was sinless, but how does that really impact his claims of being the Messiah? And I was thinking, man, the fact that Jesus' mother believed him, and even though his brothers, his physical brothers were skeptical to begin with, they became followers of Jesus. In fact, James, one of his brothers, became the head of the church at Jerusalem. They would have known if he had been a sinner. They grew up with him. Who knows better our sinful nature than the people that live in our home with us? And so Jesus, for 30 years, grew up following the father flawlessly, being obedient to God. And then he began his public ministry. But all of that showed his holiness and his wisdom and in his teaching. Even people who don't believe he was the Messiah are amazed at his teaching. Even in his own day, it says this. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he preached a message. The crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority, not as their teachers of the law. He knew what he was talking about. He expressed the truth of God in God's words. So he not only lived a holy life, but his words were full of wisdom and the character of God. That's what we would expect of a Messiah. And then he has provided change of life. You would think if you came in, into contact with a savior, that your life would be transformed that you would be more than just a mindless devotee of, of somebody who were, you're following everything they said and did. You would go from being evil to being godly. There would be a change of heart. One of the prophecies of Ezekiel is he said, when the, the Messiah comes, he would take out our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. And he was particularly talking to the hard-hearted Jewish people. So it would, it would change lives. And John 1 one of the cool statements about Jesus. It says, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You see, Jesus, the Messiah came not to build a compound, not simply to get followers, not to just get power and wealth for himself. He came so that we could believe who God really is and that we could believe he came from God. And then he, it says, whoever believes in him and receives him has the right to become a child of God. I, I hope you heard that. It says he gave the right to become children of God. Not all people are children of God. We are all created by God, but we are not all children of God. That is a choice that you make to choose to follow Jesus. So I found it interesting as I read this article by Jonas, as he went around and checked out all these different messiahs and, and they asked him what his response was. And he said, you know, some of them were, were amazing. Like being around them was like listening to a great piece of music. It was inspiring. It, it touched you emotionally. But at the end, he walked away from all these claimants, not following any of them. I, I think that's an interesting and a telling reminder that there was no change of life, even though he was investigating. On the other hand, I have another story for you. There was a guy named Lee Strobel and he and his wife lived in Chicago. And 
his wife started visiting with a neighbor and she invited her to church. And Leslie became a follower of Jesus at a church there in Chicago. And it ticked Lee off. He was upset because he was an atheist and he admits now that he was also an alcoholic and he was a hard driving investigative journalist for the Chicago Tribune. And he was upset with his wife. He thought she had sold out, that she had checked her brains at the door, that she had believed fables. And he was upset. He agreed to go with her to church one Sunday and he sat and listened to a message about the characteristics of Christianity. And right there, he vowed that he was going to disprove Christianity. And so with all his skills as an investigative journalist, he went to investigate the claims of Jesus and what he had said and what he had done and the, the historical documents and checking out the New Testament and checking out all of the claims, including the resurrection of Christ. And it took him a year and nine months. And he set out to break down everything. And in the end, Lee broke down. You may be familiar with that story because it's carried not only in a book called The Case for Christ, which if you've not read it is a wonderful reminder of all the ways that we know that Jesus is the Messiah and the only one who could ever be the Messiah. It's also in a movie, which I found to be uh, surprisingly fun to watch. If you can get past that, it's all filmed as though it were in the 70s, which is when it happened. And uh, this is the characters that play the Strobels. And it walks through his angry resentment and his interviewing of scholars and specialists to find the truth. And in the end, he didn't walk away unchanged. He gave his life to Christ. He became a follower of Jesus he eventually wrote the book Case for Christ and several other books. And he became a pastor and a speaker and an advocate for the fact that Jesus, he really is the Christ, that he really was born, that he really changed his lives. And I was thinking the, the simple Christmas story that we read. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son, and wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room available for them. I hope talking about all of these things helps that story live for you in a new way. That God moved literally heaven and earth to bring us a savior. That Christmas is not just a sentimental time of year when we enjoy the lights and the, the cookies and the, the fellowship. It should be a time when we are deeply impacted with the fact that God loved us enough to send his only son. So if you're convinced, if this is true for you, then what should be our response to a savior? How should we respond to knowing that Jesus is the only one that fits the bill? Well, obviously, first of all, we should trust him. John 1 says, but those who believed in him, those who received him, those who gave themselves to that truth, that brought about a change of life. So we need to believe. And then we also need to follow I was thinking how sad it is to see people, especially the tragedy of the Jim Jones Kool-Aid test and uh, the, 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 uh, the Branch Davidian down in Waco and people who followed their false Messiah literally to their own death. And I think sometimes it, it, it bothers me that people who believe in a false Messiah seem more devoted, more ready to change their life, more willing to sacrifice for a lie than we who know the truth. So we should follow carefully listening, letting his wisdom and, and his life transform us. And then lastly, we should tell others, we should share that, that if Jesus really is the truth, then we should be a part of that Christmas story. And I, I was thinking of the angels and it says specifically when they had seen him. So they, they heard about Jesus from the angels 
in the field and sorry, the shepherds is what I'm talking about. And the shepherds went to see Jesus. They saw him in the manger. And it says, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. So what did they do when they heard the good news? They couldn't wait to tell it. You see, this is the greatest Christmas gift ever. Not only that we receive the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior, but that we get a chance to tell other people. And I know that it's often easy for Christmas to get completely overrun with busyness, with parties, with materialism, with family celebrations. And and sometimes Jesus gets pushed way over to the side. And I hope as we look at the Christmas story, we think, man, I want to seek like the Magi. I, I want to respond and rejoice like the shepherds. I, I want to praise him like the angels. I hope that you respond to the true Savior by trusting, by following, by sharing. And I hope that you can keep the celebration of Christ in our Christmas season. I'm going to turn it over to the campus pastors or the online director. And we're going to ask you a specific question to help us with how do we do that? Thanks for joining us. Merry Christmas to you.